We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. With all the talk of Winnie the Pooh entering the public domain, I found an interesting intellectual property related question in our pile of questions, and I thought it'd be interesting to bring up now. Before we get to that, though, a disclaimer. Neither of us are lawyers or have any legal background. While the information we present here tonight is carefully researched from credible sources, nothing we say should, tonight should be taken as official legal advice. Yeah, while I may have played a lawyer once in an RPG, I haven't taken a single law course. Now, out of the question, Abe Bloom sent us an email that said, Hi, thanks for being available for help. If a game has been patented for more than 20 years, is it legal to use the card mechanics? Is it still covered by intellectual property? Regarding card mechanics, if a game is played with numbers, shapes, and colors, and the goal of the game is to collect matches, can I still play this exact game if I change the numbers or shapes or colors to a different factor such as size? Well, thanks for the great question, Abe. Now, this is something I see come up time and time again online, on forums, on Board Game Geek, Twitter, and I've even had it come up at local gaming events when talking to people about games especially when talking to people considering making games of their own. There seems to be quite a bit of confusion about this topic, and we're going to do what we can tonight to try to clear some of that up to the best of our ability. Again, we're not lawyers. Well, again, I'm not a lawyer or legally <laughs> trained either. As a photographer, I have spent more than my fair share working to make sure that I understand certain aspects of IP law well enough to help protect my own work. Now, do I need to say we're not lawyers again, or have we got it covered? I think we got it at this point say something eight times people remember it all right let's start with the easy part this is pretty simple game mechanics can't be copyrighted it is very difficult to protect game mechanics you are free to use the mechanics in any game ever published and anyone can take the mechanics in your game and use them in yours and there sorry this is the reason you see so many versions and variations of classic games so many roll and moves so many skip a turns Monopoly being, of course, the most popular and most obvious game that has a million knockoffs with a, official Hasbro versions, along with other companies putting out their own versions. Heck, one of the companies we work with regularly now, and whose games we actually enjoy quite a bit, their non-Monopoly versions, is The Op, which actually started out as USAopoly as a company that was originally created to sell uniquely themed versions of Monopoly. So the problem is, while this is mostly true today, it wasn't always the case. And it isn't, in fact, 100% true that you can't protect game mechanics. You can't copyright game mechanics, and you can't trademark game mechanics. But many games have had their specific combination of mechanics patented. Monopoly, in fact, was patented and protected from 1935 until 1952, at which time the term of its patent expired. Similarly, Magic the Gathering's process of a trading card game method of play was patented in 1994, and its protection only expired in 2014. Now, for something more related to hobby games, so well, I shouldn't say more related to hobby games when we're talking Magic the Gathering, but board game-wise, um, a few years back, a company made a card-for-card -card copy of Seven Wonders. All they did was change the names and the artwork on the cards. This was produced for promotional purposes with 2,000 copies made, and it was never available for sale, but was distributed to people who belonged in this company. All of that was perfectly legal. Now, that's not to say it should have been done. And I got to say, the gaming community came down hard on this company when Rob Davio, the designer of Seven Wonders, discovered it. And now, I got to say, it takes quite the deep dive on the net to even find reference to this scandal. What they did, though, from a legal standpoint, was fine. Now, whether they should have done it or not is a totally different matter. Beyond the legal issues is the harsh court of opinion. Plagiarism is something taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. And while in small amounts may not cross into any legally enforceable issues, as others before have discovered, being called out for such actions can, at best, draw significant negative attention to your work and, at worst, lead to an inability to get your product to market at all. For an example of an issue where literally no laws were broken and yet a game was brought to its knees 
one only has to look at the 2019 release of Alien USCSS Nostromo by Wonder Dice and the claims of plagiarism by designer Francois Bachelard. Now, what I think is a logical progression from this is the fact that if game mechanics can't be copyrighted or don't fall under intellectual property, except in rare cases using patents to protect them, and, and that, again, is only, as Sean mentioned, for specific combinations of mechanics used together in a unique way, what can we do to protect or what can a designer do to protect their tabletop game? And the opposite side of the coin, what can't you freely use from another game? And here I'm going to be passing over the reins to Sean as he's done a lot more research on this topic and has more background in IP law due to his photography business. Now, remember, if you actually have questions about the law, seek a lawyer. That's now, not us, remember? Now, to quote from the American Bar Association specifically, board games occupy a nexus of the three primary forms of intellectual property protection, copyright, trademark, and patent. Copyright is a form of protection provided by the law for a original works of authorship, allowing the holder to be the only person able to copy, distribute, or otherwise share a work under the law. Now, when it comes to copyright, ideas versus expressions are the key concept one needs to grasp. For instance, roll two dice and move your piece is not a copyrightable expression but the specific wording of the rules governing that mechanism are, when it's set down in a rule book, are copyrightable, just as the words to your novel are. No matter how intricate and convoluted you wish to make your game, it is unlikely that its actual game mechanisms will have any protection under copyright. The imagery, artwork, text of the rules, and specific game text, if it's long enough, those are copyrightable works. So I was wondering uh, if you had any examples. Like the one that comes to mind is everyone in the gaming industry knows that Wizards of the Coast did something, and I can't even remember what, to protect tapping. You weren't allowed to use the word tapping. Hey, Roger, in the chat, perfect timing, just said tapping is patented. So the exact wording from the Magic the Gathering rulebook is to tap a card is to turn it sideways to show that it's been used for the turn. Is that copyrightable? So that sentence is not, but the rules, the set of rules, the book of rules is copyrightable uh, and using significant portions of it are the same as copying chunks of my novel, uh, you know, paragraphs out of my novel and using that. Uh, is, and so they are protectable. Uh, the Magic the Gathering thing is very complex. Uh, again, in our chat room, Roger has pointed out tapping is patented and the answer is no. No, it's not, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so bodies of text are copyrightable. So the rule book for magic is a copyrighted document, but the tapping of the card is a process that we'll get to later. Now, next yes. up, trademarks are a way to identify a product and its source as unique in the marketplace. And now mm -hmm. marketplace is a key term because if you are a game, your marketplace is the, the realm of games and gaming and hobbies. It's not uh, selling refrigerators. So <laughs> there isn't any crossover between. So you're, you're, you could both, Monopoly could both be the name of a refrigerator company and the name of a board game, and there is no trademark problem. I was just thinking about that, actually. <laughs> now I got to make a name <laughs> game called Frigidaire. So now a game's name character names, logos, graphic designs, and so on, if not generic, are potential trademarks. Parker Brothers, in fact, lost the trademark on Monopoly due to its becoming generic, a ruling which actually got Congress to change the law to protect other companies from losing their trademarks in the same method that Parker Brothers did. Unfortunately, it was already too late for Monopoly which has not had an active trademark on the word or the name of the game since 1983. <laughs> Other Opoly games, however, fill the registration office, thanks in part to our friends at the Op. Yeah, I'm sure they have trademarked all of those various versions. Now, on the other hand, 
Hasbro does hold trademarks for a wide variety of designs in Monopoly, mm -hmm. including, but not limited to, the jail, go to jail, free parking, uh, chance, the railroad logo, and even the board layout. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to note about a trademark is it not only must be in use, it must be continued to be in use, and you must prove ongoing proof of its continued use in commerce is the legal term they use. So two quick things on that. One of them is I've been told this, and I'm sure it's true. This is one of the reasons Milton Bradley reproduces or Hasbro nowadays. Hasbro republishes their games every X years. That's why you'll get a new Twister. You'll get a new Monopoly. You'll get Battleship with planes instead of single ship boats. You'll get Monopoly with new pieces. It is to keep that trademark in place. Absolutely. You, you really, uh, I believe it's every five years or 10 years, depending on the country, um, that you have to prove to the uh, government that you are mm -hmm. still using this word and you are still protecting it as, as your property. Right. Now, I also, as far as I know, this is also why all, every knockoff version of Monopoly has free parking and jail with the same artwork, even though you may be playing a game with Jedi and Sith. Now, I know another thing here that we get into um, with legal disputes, and one of the big reasons is brands trying to um, protect their brands, stop what they call brand dilution. Now, again, going back to Wizards of the Coast and moving away from Monopoly, but moving into Dungeons and Dragons, there was a lot of buzz with this and them enforcing their trademark through third-party publishers putting out D&D content and it looking like theirs. So there are a bunch of rules you can't break, like you can't use the D&D &D ampersand. The dragon ampersand yeah, the is, ampersand a trademark is a trademark of, Absolutely. is a, a, a trademark of Hasbro. So you can't put that D&D &D logo anywhere in your book. But not only that, the layout for a D&D &D 5e book is set with like the titles here, this is on the spine, this is in this thing. You can't copy that either. And basically, Wizards of the Coast doesn't want anyone to go to a store and think that book you wrote was written by them right and that's where we get into the generic concept right this is kleenex is no mm -hmm. longer a trademarked term because it became generic kleenex is facial tissue everyone just calls it kleenex uh it became generic exactly so uh while there is a brand kleenex they have no trademark protection over that because mm -hmm. everyone just thinks of facial tissue as kleenex it's a generic term. And I think this is part of why Wiz the Coast fights so hard when everyone just calls every role-playing game D&D. &D. Absolutely. They don't want, oh, it's Dungeons & Dragons, or it's like Dungeons & Dragons to be the common knowledge. Uh, for instance, uh, Wizards of the Coast, Lysa LLC, just Wizards of the Coast LLC, has five pages of trademarks listed right now that I found just with a quick Google search, and that's yeah. just Wizards of the Coast, not Hasbro uh, in general. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the ampersand, all the various title the fonts. fonts of, of you know, all their different mm -hmm. um, areas of D&D &D are all covered out, yeah. covered there in detail. Mountain Papa points out another good example of this, Frisbee. And I'm mm -hmm. sure Yo-Yo would be the same thing. Yep, no, absolutely. Now, having explained why your game mechanisms aren't copyrightable, they may be patentable as utility patents. Okay. Now, this is a vastly more expensive and onerous process than any of the above by a great deal. A designer must demonstrate to the patent office that the game mechanics in question are both unique and non-obvious. Now, that means no one else can know about or have used them and Someone with, and the definition is ordinary skill in game design for this, mm -hmm. for our purposes, must not be able to come up with that concept all on their own. Right. So roll 2d6 and move is clearly not unique. But similarly, making the player roll 2d20 is hardly something that another game designer wouldn't immediately think of. So it's not there. It isn't non-obvious. And quite frankly, if I can think of it listed here as a non-game designer, it's not going to be non-obvious enough to meet the standards of a patent. 
And one of the things you got to watch is if Sean did mention it here, it would no longer be patentable, even if it was not unique and new. So here is where magic was able to scare people with legal actions about tapping cards. Now, I cannot find any current trademark issues with the word tapping. The tap symbol, however, is unquestionably trademarked. But Magic the Gathering did have a patent on their rule system, including the tapping of lands, resources, uh, for until 2014. That has expired, however, and is no longer a valid, a, val a valid patent. What I find interesting is no one's using tapping now. Is it just the fact people have gotten used to they shouldn't use tapping? Or are they just like, I don't want to be compared to magic? Yeah, I honestly can't find any legal reason why you can't go ahead and use tapping at this at this particular point in time. Yeah, uh, I like think the the that one of the reasons may be that tapping is so intimately associated with that logo and that graphic yeah, that that it becomes a problem because that is a trademark. Right. <laughs> Now, if you are able to claim a patent on your mechanisms, you are protected from a for a term from the date you applied for protection, not the date it was granted, and the length of that term varies by the type of patent and mm. country, uh, 15 to 20 years, depending on <laughs> a couple of things. So I was thinking about this and what, what out there in gaming, like since I've been playing games, what completely new ideas came along? The first one that popped into my head was deck building. So for years, we've had deck construction. And even technically deck construction going further back possibly was new. But the fact that you have an existing deck of cards, that everyone starts with the same deck of cards at the start of the game, and during the game, you add cards to the deck. I wonder if that is something that could have been patented when it came out, which as far as I know, no, it was not Dominion. I know for sure it wasn't Dominion. I think the first game to use this was actually the StarCraft board game from Fantasy Flight Games. And Fantasy Flight at that time should have been big enough to do it if they wanted to. Does this seem like it'd be patentable or is that? You know what? It, it, it so depends on if at the time of its creation, it would have been considered both unique and non-obvious. And See, that's... the people of the world at the time, the yeah. gamers thought so. And so <laughs> was potentially, yes. Uh, but it also wouldn't just have been the aspect of deck building, uh, as we see in the Magic patent, which is an 18-page patent, not including clarifications and, and, and artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the entire system. So you're describing everything you can, essentially, in order to gain that protection, not just a narrow aspect right. of that uh which I think the number of, we'll call them magic clones out there, points out that, yes, you can use lots of that as long as you do your own thing with it because they patented the whole package. Right. Therefore, individual parts of that package aren't protected. So I began by mentioning that it is an expensive and onerous process. It also may not be possible mm. if, for instance, you playtested your game in any public setting as a con or developer fest before your application was submitted, which is a, a real kick in the pants to almost yeah, every game designer. Uh, well, the well, you have to play test, right? Like, so you you can actually play test under NDA, okay. but you can't. Uh, it's it's it, the public is the issue. So if you go right. to a con, which is considered a public setting, and play it there, it's mm. no longer patentable. Uh, I actually so, wonder if that's why com so many companies are using NDAs. Because I'm like, as a content creator, Almost I'm certainly. always like, why? Why are you putting me under an NDA? Monty Cook Games. I wasn't allowed to talk about Numenera at all when I was doing. And and that that, that. does actually save them from this, that, this that's specific. That's probably what it is. That makes well. more sense than we don't want someone to steal our ideas, which is always the vibe I got. Yeah. And I'm like, as Roger pointed out in the, the chat room earlier, no one's out there to steal your ideas. Game designers don't do that. There's no... um. No uh, swipe or no swiping in the game industry, really. Now, furthermore, a court ruling in 2014 uh, that was actually specifically about accounting procedures okay. uh, invalidated what was the digital implementation of abstract ideas, uh, which is a weird and, and legalese term. But basically, if you've got an idea and make a computer do it, you're not allowed to patent it just because you you had an idea and 
found a way to make a computer do it. The problem is, uh, if you have an idea and find a way to make a game do it, that is almost certainly uh, the legal opinion is leaning uh, to also not be patentable. Um, so okay. it's, it's an interesting, it has not been tested in court, but it is looking more than likely that uh, if you, just because you have an idea, the implementation of an abstract idea into another system isn't enough to patent. It's, it's a weird legal that sounds hole. like it would tie in with all your <laughs> digital tabletops and everything. Yeah, so like, it's like it's, prototyping on tabletop simulator. I think somehow would be mixed in it's, that. It's a it's a deep rabbit hole. Uh, feel free to to go <laughs> read whoever wants to. I'm not going any deeper into yeah. that one. So the interesting thing is the reason is we're having this this discussion about patents specifically. Patents are very protective, hence the need to make them difficult to acquire and relatively short-lasting compared to other forms of IP protection. Trademarks, for instance, last for as long as you are using and enforcing the trademark. Mm -hmm. Copyrights last for either 50 or 70 years after the death of the author, depending on uh, the country and, and where you all are. And then finally, we have design patents. Okay. And now these can protect unique and non-obvious ornamental objects, but not any method of use for that object. So this would be applicable for game piece design to ensure other games didn't use similar objects. So Hans and Gluck could have tried to get a design patent on the Meeple when they published Carcassonne. And so actually in this case, he would have failed due to the similarities with Europa 1945 to 2030, which was released in 1998 and the similarities between the figures from Europa and the meeple from, uh, or like, they weren't actually called meeple in Carcassonne. No, meeple Carcassonne. Mean, goes in modern terms. Uh, but, uh, and, and the figures in Carcassonne were too similar, and, prob and Europa would have been called uh, previous work and right. invalidated the patent. So to step it back one, so Descartes editors should have tried to patent <laughs> their figures, and then we wouldn't even have the term meeple in our vocabulary, because Carcassonne probably would have put out pawns. So once a game is made, it doesn't end there. As we are all too aware of, board games can be published by many different companies. And depending on the agreements entered into with these entities, rights may become complicated. May. <laughs> I think they just do. For instance, if publisher B creates an expansion for game A, neither the game creator nor publisher C may have any rights to that expansion contest and unless details were explicit in those publishing contracts. And beyond that, we have not even yet discussed the issues of other people's art in board games and what mm -hmm. rights have been assigned to the creator by artists, potentially limiting future releases of the game or releases in foreign territories. This is actually one of the big things that keeps games from getting republished. Uh, it's one of the reasons Hero Quest took so long to come back to print, um, which also leads into the issues of licensing, which I am not going to talk about here because that is a completely different legal ball of wax we're not going to touch. But be aware that licensing issues are a thing and make sure you have the license to publish something before you publish it or use it. Now, this is, of course, all made vastly more complex by the fact that what I have described here for the most part only applies in the United States and protection in that jurisdiction may or more likely may not apply elsewhere. Patents, for instance, are only valid in the country in which you apply. So you need to apply for in every country you would like a patent. Copyright is granted the moment a work is fixed. Uh, so the, the moment you sort of finalized it basically. Um, mm -hmm. But in the US, you need to actually register your copyright uh, in order to have any legal yeah. uh, activity. Whereas other countries, that isn't a requirement at all. Which that I know is true in Canada. You do not have to file for copyright. It is implied when you make a creative work. Now, one thing to note was to disabuse an old myth. myth. Mailing yourself something and leaving yes. it in a sealed envelope in order to use the postmark as proof 
has never been a valid protection for one's intellectual property. I still hear this one all the time. I probably in the last month I've seen someone tweet it. Well, it might sway a jury. If you're in a case court, you might have some people on the side listening and you might be able to sway them with that. Uh, the poor man's copyright, as it's called, is not a legal form of protection in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely. So now we get back, <laughs> after back all this, Abe. back to the specific question. So if a game has been patented for more than 20 years, is the first phrase. Mm. So it's either patented or it's not. It's either patented or the patent has expired. A or there never was one. A search of the specific patent can easily determine its current status. If its status is expired, then no legal action regarding that patent can be brought forth by the former patent holder. That's the one where right now you should be able to use TAP, as far as we can tell. So is it still covered by intellectual property is the next statement. And yeah. if it is still for sale, and if it hasn't been 70 years since the creator died, probably yes, in some form. <laughs> yeah. Though yeah. So knowing what is and isn't covered by intellectual property is important here as well. Absolutely. So regarding card mechanics, these might have been patentable, but are unprotected by any other IP law in the US outside of the patent office. So if mm -hmm. the patent has expired, then you are free to use the mechanics by using different copyrightable or trademarkable graphic designs in your implementation. Mm -hmm. Be aware though, that your description in the rules could conceivably and unintentionally violate copyright if you were to use the same wording to describe the mechanics and gameplay as the original rule book, which as we discussed, can be copyrighted. Yeah, which is actually where the problem with that Seven Wonders game, there might have been an issue. It looked like they copy pasted the rule book and changed the icons to their new icons. So there might have been a real problem. Now, what Abed says, can I still play the exact game if I change the number, shapes, or colors to a different factor such as size? So first off, you can't copy another game's design or artwork. That's intellectual property. So it would depend on what these numbers and shapes are. Are they unique or are they generic? If it's generic numbers and shapes, you can probably use them as long as your copy version is noticeably distinguishable. Now, if they're unique shapes, there's a chance you can't. So I'm thinking of the game set. Like, I'm, I'm actually wondering if Abe is thinking of copying the game set. Because that's, when he described it, I'm like, that sounds like set. Well, there's certain S shapes in that game that I would not call generic. So you wouldn't be able to use those. And I've got to say, even if they are unique shapes, making them bigger doesn't make your version unique. Because he actually said a factor such as size. I don't think producing a large print version of a game without permission is going to go over very well. But the biggest thing about all of this to me in this entire discussion and every time it comes up is that in general, as a game designer, you don't want to copy an existing game, even if you can, even if it's 100% legal. There are thousands and thousands of games out there with new games being released all the time. Why copy an already existing game? If you like that game so much, play that game. If it's out of print, maybe look into getting the rights to the original and republishing it. Yes, taking existing mechanics from games and combining them in new ways is how we get new games, and that's perfectly cool. That's how the hobby and board gaming evolves, by making new versions of something out there. I just don't see the point of recreating something identical. It just, it seems lazy to me. I just don't get it. And trust me, board game designers don't make the money you think they do if you think by copying an existing game, you're gonna get rich quick. And all of this is without mentioning the fact the board game community as a whole really does not appreciate knockoffs or plagiarism in any form. And unless you happen to be trying to republish the, uh, the existing game for a completely new market that doesn't include any board gamers, which why you would do that, I don't know, <laughs> you're going to get a lot of heat, especially in today's days of the internet. Maybe back in the 80s when we weren't all connected, you could publish something and no one would know you copied it. But nowadays, someone's going to notice. Absolutely. So that's it for our discussion on tabletop game patents, copyright and trademarks. Remember, none of what we just said should be considered legal advice. If you're looking to protect your game or use something from someone else's game, we still recommend you get legal yes. counsel.
Now we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. If you've got a question for us, like the one we had tonight or something completely different, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com.